Am I the asshole for sending my daughter to school in her pajamas? My seven-year-old daughter, Elsie, has recently started to make mornings more difficult by throwing a fit when we ask her to get dressed for school. We've tried setting her clothes out the night before, but she still makes an issue out of it, and she doesn't want to sleep in her clothes, so that's not an option either. My wife leaves for work before me, so I'm normally the one who has to deal with the tantrums in the morning. I woke Elsie up, and as always, she refused to get dressed. I wasn't really in the mood to deal with her bullshit, and I didn't have the energy to fight with her about it, so I told her that it was okay and I'll just take her to school in her pajamas. She looked pretty shocked because I don't think it was the outcome she was expecting, but the rest of the morning went a lot smoother than normal. We got in the car and she was more quiet than usual, so I could tell she wasn't really sure what to think of it. But after driving a while, I guess the realization set in and she told me she wanted to go back home and change. I told her she had already made her decision and I wasn't driving her back home now. She started freaking out, saying she wanted me to drive her back home and she didn't want to go to school in her pajamas. But I wasn't turning the car around. So we arrived at school and she eventually went in. After my wife came home from collecting her from school, she looked pissed. She didn't say anything in front of Elsie, but later in the evening, as expected, she went off on me. She started saying that I had embarrassed her and made us look like bad parents who can't be bothered to dress our daughter. I told her that I'm sure Elsie isn't the first child to go to school in pajamas and it's not the end of the world. And she wears normal clothes every other day, so one day in pajamas isn't going to make everyone think we're bad parents. She told me she thought it was a cruel thing to do to Elsie, but in my opinion, it was harmless and taught her a lesson. Story time on how I lost my virginity at 14. I should have used the word V card. I feel like I've already be oh I've already become an overshare with my life and at this point fuck it. I also want to tell this before continuing my X series because my last X series story time, you guys were wondering about how I was talking about how I was like 15, 16 and like taking off and putting back all my clothes. Let's just get the explanation now okay so if you guys been following my ex series it started when my ex had moved from my high school and like after we started talking again and he didn't go to my high school anymore i didn't know how i was gonna see him so i had the bright idea to start sneaking out with him bitch i don't know how the first time i snuck out with this man we weren't even comfortable with each other like that if you guys were keeping up with the series the way i explained he was in the beginning it felt really genuine i was comfortable in the sense that i felt like he was serious about me but not comfortable in the way that we had like not really spent much time together before the first First time we snuck out, had my first kiss with him. And then we snuck out a couple other times after that. Girl, we weren't even like official yet. But in my head, and I think that he thought the same thing. We knew it was like exclusive. Or that's how I saw it. But at this point, like I was sure. The way that we were talking, the way he was towards me, I was sure I did like him and I wanted him to be my first boyfriend. I think we had been singing out a couple times. And we were good, you know, like it was like we knew we were like together. Well, again, at least that's how I felt. I really like this relationship let me so traumatized to the point that like I really don't know the way he saw it the whole time, like all along. One day we were like texting and he was flirting with me and I really did not know how to flirt. Like I just kind of like tried to go along with it, you know, because I had never flirted with anyone in my life before. Girl, I forgot, like I don't know exactly what he said, but I remember a text where he said, oh, we'll see about that when we see each other. And then I was like, girl, when he texted me oh we'll see about that when we see each other i was like wait what do you mean i was like wait i'm fucked i was like wait what is he talking about like wait like what does he think that i mean like this is what i mean by i was like young innocent and naive like i really didn't know what the fuck i was doing i really didn't like this was my first boyfriend i didn't know so then like i was shitting bricks the whole time that we're gonna sneak out to see each other i was like wait what do you mean i was like wait Later on, when we had like years of dating already, I didn't even tell him none of this. Like, I never told him none of this. So then the day comes when we're gonna sneak out, and I'm like, wait, bitch, like, you can't back out of this now. Like, you were over here talking all of this stuff through freaking text. You can't back out now. When I tell you, I barely even knew the meaning of SEX. Like, I barely knew that fucking meaning. So I was shitting brick. I really hope you guys don't see me differently after the story time because this was me like back then. I don't even want to tell you guys the location because obviously we were sneaking out. I was 14, he was 15. Like, bitch, where the fuck were we gonna go? Like, I don't even want to tell you guys the location, but you could only imagine it was some hood rat shit first time was an attempt this time that i was really fucking freaking out because i didn't know that he meant that when he was like texting me this flirty shit like i didn't know he meant that it was two times okay this setting was even like worse than the second time but i kid you not the only thing i've said this before in my youtube q a video the only thing that was going through my head was what the fuck my mom and my grandma would think about me We're, like literally about to do that get into it that's what was going through my head like i was 14 i didn't get turned on like that i didn't even know what the fuck i was doing like 
it was that type of thing and I didn't realize what I was doing. I just knew I was scared as shit of what my mom and my grandma would think about me. You know how people get scared of the pain? Well, that was like the last thing in my head. I was worried about what my grandma and my mom were gonna think about me. If they saw me in that moment, in that setting, in that location with that person, Oh my god. I'm gonna be a little TMI with you guys and tell you guys why it didn't happen that first time. It was because like I was literally like I had never done that before and it just he couldn't make it happen. I actually do want to say this so that girls that are 14 years old aren't as naive as I was. I don't know if it was just a me thing but like please don't be as naive as I was. Seriously felt like I couldn't say no anymore because like that was the person that I was like with and I kind of like just trusted it in a way. And I just felt like I couldn't say no. That night we did go home without any of that activity going on which like in the moment i was like damn bitch like what the fuck were you about to do next time we snuck out it actually did happen i was 14 i didn't know what the fuck i was doing i barely knew about protection i didn't even get turned on like that in that point that whole experience wasn't even pleasurable it wasn't even the way you would think that your first experience is gonna be like and that's kind of also why i wanted to tell this story so that people don't go and do stupid shit like what i did because you don't want your first time to be like that. So you don't want it to be in a ghetto setting. You don't want the only thing that you're thinking about in the moment is what your mom and your grandma would think about you if they saw you in that, in that activity, girl. Because that just means you're not ready for it. And I definitely was not ready for it. I just didn't know how to say no because I was so naive. And so like, I, I thought that I had to because I felt like this guy was good for me because of the way that we trauma bonded and the little things that he would do for me. I didn't know how to tell him that I wasn't ready. And I also, after that, years into dating, I also never told him how I didn't feel any type of pleasure. I never admitted that to him because I just didn't want to burst his bubble. But that's really how I felt in the moment. I look back at it and I just think about the way I was so naive and, and like things could have been so different for me. My feelings for him were always like very genuine though so I will give it that like at least I didn't do it with someone who I didn't even like 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 that or give a fuck about. I think things happen for a reason and everything I went through with him taught me a lesson that a lot of the things that I went through with him are the reason why I am how I am now and who I am now. And let's not say because after that first time, I did become a freakiness that one. Let's really not, let's not. Anyways, I hope that other than entertaining you guys, somebody out there took this as a lesson. Because I still be looking back at this and be thinking, Miriam, what the hell were you on? I was really just a young teenage naive girl who was going through personal shit. And I felt like this guy really understood me. I felt like he was really there for me. I felt like... He was like everything that I ever thought I wouldn't have. As a first time mom, I only pushed for five minutes and did not tear before my baby came out. But let me tell you how the whole labor process went down. I remember when I started to like go into early labor, I watched so many TikToks to be like, is this it? Like you don't know as a first time mom. So I actually was in labor for probably about 36 hours. So on Thursday at around like 10 a.m. I started to feel almost like period like cramps. Mind you, I gave birth on Friday at 7.43 p.m. I started timing these like period like cramps that I figured were contractions and they were getting closer and closer together. And so I called Steven and I was like, it could be time, but like, I don't really know. Steven came home from work, he was so excited, and we were just hanging out waiting, and I was like, I feel like it's just not it, because they weren't super painful. They lasted and were like, I don't know, a few minutes apart, until probably about like 6 p.m., and then they stopped. So I told Steven, I was like, for one, I'm glad we didn't go in, and for two, what we're gonna do is if the cramps wake me up out of my sleep at night, we're gonna go in because then I feel like they are like strong enough where maybe it's the real deal. So sure enough, at 4 a.m. on Friday, I was woken up out of my sleep with cramps and I woke up Steven and I was like, I think that this is it. Like we need to get up, we need to get going. We ended up going to the hospital and on the way to the hospital, my contractions started to like get farther and farther apart and then they went away. We still went to the hospital, I got checked, they told me I was dilated to a three and they were like, walk around for a little bit, see if we could get labor moving, otherwise we're sending you home. Sure enough, they sent me home. I went home, I took a nice nap from like 10 to one and then around three o'clock, I went for a nice little walk and my contraction started to pick up again. And here's where it gets good. At 3.30, well, like three o'clock, I'm going for my walk I get home, I'm sitting on a ball. During my walk, I pray to God. I was like, God, just please break my water. It'll be the best case scenario. Then I know that it's time. 
Sure enough, I get home, I'm bouncing on my ball. This is like within 15 minutes that I pray to him. I just hear, or I feel, pop, pop, and I run to my bathroom right here and just gush. My water broke and I start dancing. I'm like, yeah, my water broke, my water broke. I'm freaking out like it is time. She is coming within the next 24 hours. Steven was also home and he's like, we gotta go. Like you're about to be in pain soon. Let's back up, let's get going to the hospital. We called my mom and dad, told them to hop on the next flight. They are in a different state than us. And we were like, okay, like it's actually time. My water is broke. And we got in the car, of course, 3.30, rush hour traffic, but I was just vibing. So we get to the hospital and we go through triage and they make sure, confirm that it was my water that broke as if I just like was peeing my pants like over and over and over. Um, obviously it was my water that broke. Went in for, um, got admitted to labor and delivery. And this is another crazy part of the story. So they checked me and I was at a five before and they were like, okay, for a first time mom, it takes like hours. We'll check you around like nine o'clock. Then we'll check you in like three hours after that. So Steven and I are like, okay, is she going to be born tonight or on Saturday morning? Like when is this happening? So it just so happened that at 730, my doctor came in and said, I'm going in for a C-section. I just want to check you really quick before I go in just to make sure. And she checked me and she started stay, saying in medical jargon, like stage four, blah, blah, blah. And I look at my nurse and she's like, baby's here, it's time to push. I was like, wait, I literally looked at Steven and I was like, I thought we had hours. Like, what is going on? They tossed my legs up on the stirrups and like I said, within five minutes, baby was here. They have you push during your contractions. I pushed for a contraction and one more push and baby came to the world. It all happened so fast. The nurse was like so shocked. So the shift change was at 7.30. She was told like, okay, she's at five centimeters, check her in a couple hours. She came in to my room at 7.35 and the baby was here at 7.43. And there was a nursing student and it was her first day. And the nurse was like, don't think that this is always how it goes. I did not tear. The baby was put right onto my chest, had no jaundice, no anything, like she was born perfectly. Um, I got up, my recovery, like by the end of the evening, I literally was like running around, like I felt like I could like run a marathon, I was totally fine, not sore. The next day I was a little bit sore. And so I turned to the nurse and I was like, so what would have happened if the doctor did not come and check on me before her C-section? And she was like, well, I would have called the on-call doctor who wouldn't have made it in time. So uh, we just would have figured it out together. And so she would have delivered me, which she was fantastic. Like I know she would have done great, uh, her and the nursing student. Oh, and I get this all the time. Yes, I did get an epidural. I made it very known as soon as I got into triage, like, hey, I want an epidural. Don't make me, don't let me miss my opportunity to get this epidural. So I felt like nothing at all either. And to end, they said, Next time you have a kid, make sure they know how fast your baby came because the next baby's gonna just literally fly right out of you. Like, make sure you get to the hospital ASAP. So my story with this is a little bit different because I grew up in a household with extremely progressive parents. Like, my mother will not even say the word janitor because she thinks it's a derogatory term for custodians. But somehow, at the age of six, I randomly decided to become homophobic. So let's get into that. I have known from a very young age that I am okay. Like when I was in preschool, I was looking up girls' skirts. There was never ever any question that I'm fruity. And because I was only six years old at the time of this story, my parents had not had any talks with me about sexuality or what it meant to be gay. So I knew that I was attracted to girls. I just didn't really know what that meant for me. So one night my entire family is gathered around the TV and we are watching ice skating and I could not tell you for the life of me why the fuck we were watching ice skating because nobody in my family gives a fuck about ice skating. But all of a sudden there are two men ice skating together and that clicked for me, right? I was like, that's, and I am also, so what does the family think about? So I asked my parents why two men are ice skating together and my mom goes, oh, well, honey, they're gay. And I have no idea if the two men ice skating together were actually gay or if this was my mom's way of kind of planting the seed in my brain that not all romantic relationships are between a man and a woman. But regardless, 
this was a huge moment in my life because this was the first time I was being told what being gay is. So now my little six-year-old brain is running on a thousand miles a minute and I'm like, okay, two boys liking each other is gay and two girls liking each other is probably also gay, but what does the family think about gay? I still have no answer. And in my little six-year-old brain, the most logical way to get this answer from my family was to turn around, look at them, and say, I hate gay people. What do you mean you hate gay people? You are a gay people! So obviously, chaos ensues. My mom is losing her mind and she's saying, no you don't, you don't hate gay people. We don't hate anybody. And then my older brother looks at me with this face full of horror and disgust and he goes, my uncle is gay. Like it's not also my uncle. So I've just caused mass panic for my family, right? Because they think that I am a homophobic six-year-old, but I'm just sitting there, la 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 la, my family loves gay people. I was stoked as fuck. This is fantastic news for me. I just found out that I'm gay and that my family loves gay people in the span of like two minutes. Really unfortunate turn of events for my family though, to find out that they had a homophobic six-year-old living with them but still really, really great news for me. I never came out to my parents either. I just brought home a girl one day and they treated it the same exact way they did when I brought boys home in the past. They welcomed her with open arms and now I am marrying that girl and my parents absolutely adore her. My husband got arrested at the altar and is now locked up in a Mexican prison. Story time. So at the start of the month, I thought I was marrying my best friend, Steve. We had decided that we wanted a destination wedding and we were really, really in love with Mexico. We booked our dream venue and invited our nearest and dearest. I had my best friend, Amy, as my maid of honor. We'd literally been best friends since like year one. Always dreamed of the day we'd get married. Steve had Amy's boyfriend as his best man. So the ceremony is incredible. Everything is literal perfection. Until the line, anyone have any reason why these two should not marry? At which point, Amy chirps up, starts sobbing. She says, I do. I'm like, bitch, that is my line. I say I do. This is when she discloses that she has been having an affair with my husband for three years. I was a mess. I was looking at Steve, then looking at Amy, looking at Steve, then looking at Amy. Then Steve's best man, Dave, who is obviously Amy's boyfriend, is like, the fuck? He is then looking at Steve, then looking at Amy, then looking at me. Steve is like, why are you doing this? Don't do this. He's like, why couldn't you just keep it a secret? Why now? Amy's sobbing like, I couldn't let you go through with it. I love you, Steve. Your fucking boyfriend stood right there. <laughs> the crowd were like this. Literally no one had any clue what to do. And then the fight happened. Dave, the best man, literally smacks Steve over the head. Steve's on the floor. He then proceeds to push the floral archway that we're getting married under straight on top of him. Me and Amy are just screaming. Steve gets up from underneath the archway. And I've never seen anyone change quicker. Steve was about to choose violence. He walked up to his dad who was sat in the front row and very calmly asked if he could have his chair. I don't know why his dad stood up. Steve picks up the chair and throws it at Dave. Like Dave has done anything wrong here anyway at this point the officiant has run off we didn't know where she'd been later to find out that she'd called the police see i don't know how these police got here so quick because they were still fighting by the time they rocked up this moment in time steve was on top of dave he couldn't see dave doing anything and steve gets arrested in mexico at our wedding after i found out he'd been having an affair with my best friend did anybody have that on their bingo card for this year? So Steve gets arrested. Amy goes chasing after them. Hun, you can have him. Of course, we paid for this incredible venue, an incredible, like, party. And it felt like a waste not to go ahead with it. So me and Dave just got absolutely hammered. The DJ didn't speak a word of English and thought that me and Dave were getting married. Just thought, fuck it, let's play into it. We had our first dance. Some of the guests thought it was the strangest thing ever. So the next morning, I woke up and I was in Dave's bed. I've had some really traumatizing bikini waxes. So here are just some of my most traumatizing stories from getting a bikini wax. I must have caught my bikini waxer on a really bad day one time because the way I could just feel it in her energy. She was not in a great mood. The way that woman was ripping my shit was as if I had fucked her boyfriend and she like found out and wanted to take out her anger on my bikini wax. I like kid you know, I almost cried. I almost cried in that moment. I was like, she is going to take my whole pussy with her at this point. Like, 
I just know she was having a bad day and the rips were insane. As vocal as I am, I really can't, I don't, there's some type of vulnerability when I have my literal vagina in a bitch's face that I just cannot, like I didn't wanna be like, ooh, take it down a notch, like take it down a notch. I just like don't have it in me. I just had to lay there and take it like a champ. And it was honestly, it was one of my worst painful waxes. Next one has to be my most vivid experience I've ever had. This woman is applying the hot wax, applies it directly to my clitoris. Okay, I don't know if I can say clit, so I like had to say the, the medical word because like, ugh, I'm already beefing with TikTok and like they would be like, I'm taking this down, so let's just get medical with it, my clitoris. I just was like, this woman, this is gonna be the worst fucking experience I've ever had in my life. Oh, at this point, I'm like, she is trying to take my clitoris with her as a fucking souvenir. Like there is no, I've, I've had so many waxes. There's no need for the hot wax to be there ever, ever, ever. That wax shaped me as a woman. And I was like, I can't do this shit anymore. But I bought a package. So it's like, I have to go back. But that wax, I, I will never, I called Tizzy right after. I'll say, you'll never guess where she put the wax. You'll never guess. But this worst wax, like I will, Never forget this because it was my first wax in years. And I like wasn't familiar with the wax etiquette. Like I low key forgot about it. I was like, wait, the, you're supposed to let the hair grow to like a grain of rice, right? I did not fucking do that. I had like shaved a week prior and then went in to go get a wax. They should not have waxed me, but, but they did. Like I saw Jesus himself during that wax. Like imagine your first wax back after years and my hair maybe like this. It's so fucking small, like so small. I should not have been waxed at that time. I remember being like, this hurts so much more than what I fucking remembered. Like, this is so fucking painful. And I had to act really cool and chill in this wax, mind you, because she was like, oh my God, like, I love your TikToks. As she's staring at my literal clitoris, she's like, I, I love your TikToks. And I'm like, yeah, girl, let's talk, let's talk TikTok. Like, I'll always talk with you guys. But like, I, I genuinely was about to end that wax early. And I'm not like a pussy ass bitch. Like, I can take some fucking pain. But I was like, I think I might need to end I left that wax feeling like I just like a different I felt like I wasn't even on this planet I was like I'm in so much pain like I don't feel like me the girl was like I couldn't get all of it but like you could come back and tomorrow or like when it grows out a little bit more and I'll get it more I'm like don't you even don't you worry about it you'll never see me again like don't you worry about it it's fine but love you girl and thank you for liking my TikToks I hope you like this one no but for me during the wax the worst is when they're like all right, deep breath, three, two, and I'm like, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. Like, don't even count me down, bitch, just rip my shit. Like, every time I hear the, all right, deep breath, three, two, I'm, I wanna kick a bitch in the fucking head. Like, I really do, it's just like, rip my shit and keep it going, let's make it quick, let's make it quick. Like, don't, I can't do this. My mom had a stroke on Easter of 2021 and it eventually led to her death. Y'all know I love talking about my mama, but I thought since it's Easter and it's been three years now, which is crazy, I would shed some more light on what actually happened. So back in 2021, I was the breakfast manager at a Holiday Inn Express where I basically made all the scrambled eggs, bacon sausage, and prepped it for the day for the hotel guests. My mom was retired, but she had been working as a substitute PE teacher at one of our local elementary schools, but also on the weekends, she would sometimes come and help me at the hotel. I remember she had bought a whole bunch of decorations from Dollar Tree and set up the breakfast area to be Easter festive themed. My mom was disabled but she didn't like not working so that's why she was working those two jobs. She was actually off on Easter weekend though so I was at work and she had told me that she was going to be doing some yard work outside like mowing the grass, cutting weeds, whatever. So right after breakfast had ended I was cleaning up and I get a call from her and she sounds really out of it on the phone and she told me that she thinks she got overheated while she was mowing the grass. I asked her if she needed me to do anything, if she was okay and she said, no, don't worry, I'm inside now in the AC. I'm drinking a lot of water. I just wanted to call and let you know and see how things are going. I was a little concerned, but I told her, I'll be home soon after I finish cleaning up. Take care of yourself, rest until I get there at least. There's one thing about my mama, she was a single mom and she was a hard ass worker. She was disabled, but she still worked as much as she could and she would do the entire yard, always pushing herself past her limits, I thought. But um, 30 minutes later, she called me back. I knew immediately from how she sounded on the phone when I answered that something was really wrong. She was slurring her words so badly, I could barely understand what she was saying. And so I dropped everything I was doing, grabbed my keys, and on the way out, I told the lady at the front desk, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with my mom, I gotta go. The house that we were living in at the time was only like five minutes away from the hotel, but I should you not, I probably made it there in like two minutes. I was running red lights, speeding like 75, 80 miles an hour. And when I got there, I knew she was having a stroke. She had actually had another stroke a couple years before then. So I knew immediately, I saw the signs. One side of her face was drooping. She could not get out any words, any coherent words. And she was like slumped, 
very much out of it and I picked her up and I walked her to my car because I was not about to wait on no ambulance and I hauled ass to the emergency room. This happened in 2021 so COVID protocols were still in place so when we got to the emergency room there was a table with nurses sitting outside of the building and I checked her in and I had to wait in my car in the parking garage for hours. It seemed like it took forever for them to call me and get me an update but I waited a little bit longer and they let me come in finally to her room to see her. They had her on an IV getting something called TPA which is really helpful if you're having a stroke and you can get it within the first three hours it can save a lot of lives and it can save i think it like breaks up the blood clots in your brain or something like that i was just glad to see that she was stable and the doctors thought that with the tpa she would be okay but i remember looking down at her arm while i was looking at her i looked down at her arm where the iv was and the entire bed underneath her arm was soaked i started freaking out i brought it to the attention of the nurses and when they saw what i was looking at what i was talking about they very quickly rolled her changed the sheets and restuck the IV in her. They were moving fast, y'all. So I was freaking out. I was like, was that the IV with her TPA in it? And they said, yeah, but don't worry. We have it fixed. Everything's going to be okay. And I'm like, okay, but I, she's been in here for hours. So how long has she really been getting the medicine and has any been getting in her system? I don't know what it was, but something about the way they sprung into action when I pointed out the very large puddle of liquid underneath her IV, something about the way they were rushing so bad, just I just had a gut feeling and I started recording. But one of the nurses saw me and looked at me and goes, you are not allowed to record us. And trust me, I understand like not wanting to be uncomfortable with somebody recording you at your job. But to me, like that was the health of my mother in question. And the way y'all are acting so sketchy about this, I feel like you know you fucked up. But my mom was stable and she spent a few weeks in the neuro ICU before she was moved to the rehab level of the hospital. After a couple months, she was discharged to come home with us and scheduled to have rehab like two days out of the week. But she wasn't really progressing as fast as she wanted to. So she decided she wanted to move into a rehab facility slash nursing facility so she could get physical therapy every single day. But after a few months at the rehab facility, she started declining again because the stroke had affected her brain a lot more than we had originally thought. And she ended up passing away in January of 2022. I still wonder to this day if I was correct and that was the TPA medicine leaking out of her IV and if they had actually inserted the IV correctly into her arm and she'd been getting all of the medicine when I got her to the hospital if it would have saved her life or like you know prevented more of the brain damage from happening but but whatever happened happened and I know that she is no longer hurting anymore she is healthy and at peace and even though I was really depressed for years up until like the end of last year honestly I have come to terms with her death and I'm at peace about it too strokes are hereditary on my mom's side of the family she had a couple my grandma also died from the complications after having multiple strokes. Even though it was hereditary, the doctor said that it was also probably due to stress. And so I think it's just really important that everyone knows the signs of someone having a stroke. But especially if you have it in your family. If it runs in your bloodline, you need to know. Because a lot of times if you can recognize the signs of someone having a stroke and get them to a doctor ASAP, you can save their life. So the way I learned to remember the signs is by remembering the word fast. If you can remember the word fast, then you'll remember the signs of a stroke. F stands for face drooping. Like if you notice one side of their face seems to be like they can't move it that well, face drooping. A is for arm weakness. Uh, when people have strokes, it's harder for them to lift up their arms or squeeze things. So if you notice they're having any weakness in their arms, a is for arm weakness. S stands for slurred speech, self-explanatory. So if you've noticed face drooping, arm weakness, or slurred speech, then it is T. Time to call 911. But Am I wrong for ruining my younger daughter's engagement announcement? My husband and I have two daughters, one who's 32 and another who just turned 25. Our older daughter was married for six months to her partner of seven years. They divorced two years ago, and since then, my daughter has been dating other guys, but not as serious. My older daughter always expresses how she wants to be happily married to the right person and to be a mom. She came out of a very toxic situation with her ex since he had cheated on her with multiple women and even let his mom verbally abuse my daughter. Ooh, I already feel the favoritism coming out of this one. Ooh, you are... Mm. She has expressed how she feels she deserves better and I want the best for her as well and it saddens me to know she does not live the life she wants to. My younger daughter has been with her current boyfriend, now fiancé, for five years. One week ago, he proposed to her and she came home to show us the ring and announce it. My husband and I told her congratulations and I said, well, now let's hope your sister finally finds her happiness too. My younger daughter didn't reply at this but gave me a side eye. We were then calling relatives to announce the engagement. All of them were happy for my younger girl but for all of us, it was bittersweet 
tweet how my older daughter still hasn't found the happiness she wishes for. My younger got pissed about how every one of us turned her engagement into a pity party for my older girl and she told me she can't even have this one special occasion to herself and how she can't even be engaged and announce it without everyone making it about her sister. My, my husband and I told her not to act jealous and how she should be more understanding and empathetic on why we are also mentioning her older sister. She says we are the assholes for finding excuses on why we turn this into something about her sister and how she believes we'll find a way to make her wedding about her poor older sister as well. I thought her reaction was uncalled for and that she lacks empathy for the traumatic divorce her sister went through, but part of me and my husband also believe that we should probably not make it so obvious and we believe we might have acted a little like an asshole.